Hello, welcome to our workshop, Agriculture and Environmental Science-Based Policy, Opportunities and Challenges for U.S. Agriculture and the Environment, brought to you by CIFER, the Council on Food, Agricultural and Research Economics. My name is Gal Hachman and I am the CIFER Board Chair and Professor at Rutgers University. It is my pleasure to moderate this event. It's CIFAR's mission to translate high-level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymakers, elected officials, and federal administrators. When we demonstrate the value of the profession to these groups, the Council increases public appreciation for research, extension, outreach, and academic programs in agriculture and applied. While economists recommend using market incentives, there is widespread use of regulations to achieve agricultural and environmental research management objectives. This workshop probes into new vantage points to explain this reality, emphasizing political economy, irreversibility, and supply chain perspectives. Concerns about climate change and the environment, food security, and the agricultural sector's economic viability are behind government interventions. While economists advocate for financial incentives like a carbon tax, we see significant reliance on regulation in reality. One explanation has been uncertainty, but we will argue that it has been of limited power by itself. Alternative descriptions include political economy and political power affecting the distribution of benefits or the desire to establish irreversible outcomes given political uncertainty in democratic regimes. Also, uncertainty and credit constraints in management of supply chain that consist of multiple markets to establish new industries like biofuels and solar energy. These approaches help explain both environmental and agricultural policies. In the case of environmental policies, we address why a carbon tax is not used, and instead, we have various forms of command and control. In agriculture, we have a mixture of semi-market-based policies, for example, crop insurance, storage control, and conservation reserve program, that has an element of subsidy, and understanding their impact and motivation is challenging, yet valuable. We encourage all of you to follow us on our various social platforms and subscribe to our newsletters. We have a podcast, Get a Grip and Fair, that is available on our website, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and on RSS website. You can also search our name, the Council on Food, Agriculture, and Research Economic, on any of these platforms. Follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions, please contact us at information at .org. Before we start, a quick word of thanks to our partners. This event would not be possible without the support of the ASSA and without NIFA's very generous financial support. Thank you both. Also, this and other CFIR programming wouldn't be possible without continuing support of the Agriculture and Applied Economic Association, AAEA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistical Service, NAS, as well as USDA's Economic Research Service, ERA. And with that, I'll give the floor first to Jinji Wu from North Carolina, Chair. Good morning, every, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. And uh, first, I want to say uh, thank you to, to Gail and David for putting this uh, uh, workshop together, and uh, which provide a forum uh, for us to talk about agriculture policy, environment policy in this broad, in this general econ uh, conference. So my kind of assignment today is to talk about uh, some political economy consideration in the design of agri-environmental uh, uh, policies. And uh, cl clearly this is not a new topic, uh, but in my view, uh, still very, very important and highly relevant today. 
and perhaps more so than, than before because uh, now each year uh, governments spend billions of dollars on uh, uh, agri environment program. So just recently, uh, the, in, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act actually included $20 billion to support USDA's uh, agri environment pro program, including uh, $8.45 billion for environment quality incentive program and almost $5 billion for regional uh, conservation partnership program. So it's a, it's a lot of money spent on uh, agri environment program. And this chart basically shows the kind of a trend of conservation spending uh, uh, agri environment program in the U.S. As you can see, uh, since the, 19, uh, since the early 1980s, the spending has increased significantly, uh, from less than half a billion dollars uh, in, uh, in tw uh, 1983 to over six billion dollars right now. That's uh, in addition to the 20 billion dollar just being authorized by the Inflation Reduction Act. And the early increase really due to the ex rapid expansion of land retirement program under the CRP. And, but later on, you can see a lot of ex increase were due to the expansion of the so-called working land program, such as EQIP and CREP. And uh, compared to the United States, uh, historically, uh, EU countries spend con uh, considerably less on agri of the program, for example, in uh, in 20, in 1998, uh, 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 EU spent about 4% of the total conservation, uh, exp uh, total ag spending on agri the program compared with 6%. However, in recent years, EU countries has dramatically increased their spending on agri the programs, particularly since uh, 2007. And since then, the spending has been more than, tri than tripled. Uh, in, in EU countries. With the rapid increase, what the, that mean the reason, you know, why we have such a dramatic increase in conservation spending? Well, because there's this broad public support. And, and many interest groups now have accepted uh, conservation spending and conservation payments as a kind of a viable alternative to traditional direct government payments. You know, to farmers, it's a new way of delivering farm income support, but to environmentalists, it's a new way of encouraging a landowner farmer to do conservation, right? Government do get something out of the, out, out of the payment, in this case, the environmental benefits. To many of the in NGO group, it's a new way of, of fighting poverty, because poverty reduction is, is, is a big goal for many nonprofit uh, non-profit profit organization, and to others is a new way of delivering uh, a farm uh, income support, kind of a status quo. Historically, the U.S. spent a lot of money to support farm income. And because of the broad support, and there's, there's a lot of increase in conservation spending, and the question is, you know, how should funds be distributed uh, across different geographic areas, for example? Across, uh, across different jurisdictions. You know, should funding uh, be concentrated on a few selected uh, watershed or distributed over a broader area? Okay. And should funding be uh, priority be given to area with worse environmental problem or area that has made a lot of environmental improvement? And within a given ge geographic area, what criteria should government use to select, uh, say, land for conservation? For example, should government you know, target marginal land, the least productive land, or land that most vulnerable to environmental damage? And what should be payments based on? Should payments be based on adoption of certain conservation practice, such as uh, no-till or cover crop, which is very, very uh, emphasized by, by Baden in, in, in his recent remark on this? Or should payments be based on adoption of certain, uh, certain, uh, certain measure of environmental benefits, okay? And if a bidding process is used to select bids into the program, what, you know, these criteria look like, okay? And finally, what are the economic, environmental, and distribution implications uh, of, of these different targeting criteria, you know? If 
poverty reduction is the goal, which criteria is most effective for, for achieving that goal. Okay? And uh, if you want to spend, if the government wants to spend the money uh, over a broader geographic area, what are the trade offs between efficiency and, and equity? Uh, so there's a lot of issues. These issues are, uh, are kind of pretty challenging, not, not, not only intellectually, you know, intellectually challenging, but also kind of a policy relevant. And clearly, in this, you know, I hope the rest of the speaker can address most, hopefully, some of the issue. But here, I'm just going to focus on the last issue, kind of the distributional implication of these different targeting criteria. So uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, server economy used uh, criteria to target a resource for conservation. Then I'm going to talk about the political economy implication of these different targeting criteria. And finally, if I have time, I probably don't have a lot of time, I'm going to talk about the challenge for designing a truly efficient uh, 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 con uh, conservation program. Okay. So as you know, over the years, the, the targeting criteria has evolved significantly. Uh, uh, since the 19, uh, since the early 1980s, and uh, here are the, you know, here I highlight four commonly mentioned or commonly discussed targeting criteria. I call them cost targeting, and benefits targeting, or benefits cost ratio targeting, or benefit maximization targeting. Okay. And benefits, the uh, cost targeting basically target the marginal land, the least productive resource for conservation. Okay, and several study has found that the targeting criteria of CRP. Uh, it's really consistent with cost targeting before, before the, uh, 1992 sign okay? And benefits targeting back to target resource that offers the largest environmental benefit <coughs> per resource unit for, for the per acre of land. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife historically <coughs> kind of target, kind of target uh, wetland and other resource for conservation based on this kind of a biologic criteria, mostly focused on Kind of uh, uh, environmental benefits without considering too much, uh, too much uh, cost. And benefits cost ratio targeting basically tar target resource uh, that offers the highest benefits cost ratio. And uh, and in recent and you know in recent uh, CRP snap, the, the the program use uh, an index called environmental benefit index to kind of select bait into the program. That index consider both uh, benefits. That, that powers are offered as well as the rental cost, kind of in, in, a, in a sense, kind of consistent with benefits cost ratio targeting. And finally, we, and we have this benefits uh, maximization targeting, basically the target resource uh, that offers the largest environmental benefits uh, per dollar expended, right? That's uh, actually that's the stated objective of, of some of the, uh, the working land programs, such as uh, Equip and CRE. So this is the, there are different targeting criteria has been used. So in a paper we did quite a years ago with David Zimmerman and Bruce Babcock, we kind of compared the performance of these uh, different targeting criteria in terms of uh, among the land preserved, and uh, the land in production, land in conservation, for the output, output price, consumer surplus, producer surplus, and environmental benefits. And we found that at cost targeting actually leads to the largest amount of land in conservation and smallest amount of land in production. As a result, output the output is lowest, output price is highest, and which can lead to highest producer surplus and the lowest consumer surplus. So as a result, you can see uh, this is kind of an older old uh, slides. I just but anyway, so this is uh, you know as a result. Uh, you know, cost targeting is the landowner's most favorite strategy. The landowner likes cost targeting because it leads to the largest uh, uh, producer surplus. It is also the most kind of poor, poor policy if the, if the poor are the landowner because, it, because these targeting criteria lead to the largest uh, consumer surplus. And, and, but if landowner are consumer but not the landowner, and this targeting strategy is actually the least pro pro policy because the, the, the pool won't benefit from this spending but has to pay a higher food price. Okay, so it so really depends on whether the the, the landowner, uh, whether the you know the the, the pool is a landowner or not landowner. And 
as I mentioned, indeed, CRP used uh, cost targeting uh, before 1992. And benefits targeting, on the other hand, will lead to the largest uh, consumer surplus. So it should be the consumer's uh, most preferred strategy, <laughs> particularly the consumer who benefits little uh, from, from this the benefit generated by the program. And it's also be, be the kind of labor uh, input suppliers most preferred strategy. Why? Because th this targeting strategy will lead to large amount of land in production. So as a result, demand for, for inputs such as fertilizer or, or tractor will be the largest. Okay? So labor and input supplier should prefer uh, benefits targeting. Uh, it is landowners' least preferred strategy because it leads to the lowest uh, uh, producer surplus. Benefits cost ratio targeting can lead to, can lead to the highest um, you know, uh, economic efficiency, but it also maximize environmental benefits for a given budget. If the program is small, relatively small, it's not going to affect price. But if the program is sufficiently large, it can risk the price, uh, you know, and this targeting criteria is no longer maximizing environmental the benefit for given budgets. Okay? And in fact, although this, this strategy is the most efficient, it's not the most preferred strategy of any group. So none of the group actually prefer this targeting strategy. And finally, uh, benefit maximization targeting uh, is, is less efficient than cost benefits ratio targeting, but would generate largest environmental the benefit for a given budget if the program is large enough to increase our price. Okay, so uh, in fact, it is, it is the, as I said, it's the kind of, a, uh, it's the preferred, it's the, it's the goal. Maximizing environmental the benefits for dot expanded is the staged goal of, 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 of some of the working land program, like, like equip. Another uh, political economy consideration in the targeting conservation program is kind of regional distribution of program benefits. If you look at the CRP, you can see that CRP land are heavily concentrated actually in, in the grid plan and Montana and, and some you know, area along Columbia River Basin, a little bit, you know, some, you know, some CRP land in, also in, in, in Corn Belt. So the, but you know, the east, some of the east, west coast state, the east coast state, there are very few, the benefits are very little from the CRP. Uh, spending, but you know, broad, bro broad group program participation has been an important policy goal, and USDA would prefer to spread the money kind of more, more broadly. But the question is, can they achieve this without compromising much economic efficiency? So, in, in a paper I did a few years ago, we kind of look at this issue, and uh, we look at this basic the efficiency equity trade-off. Uh, in the targeting of conservation uh, program by using uh, data from uh, SAP 18. So this downward sloping curve shows that we call them efficiency equity frontier. Basically it shows the maximum efficiency that can be gained for a given level of equity of, or the maximum equi equity that can be achieved for a given level of e efficiency. Here the efficiency is measured by the even the benefit generated per dollar expanded. Okay? And we, we, sh we can show that if the program, uh, if the farmer, if the landowner are compensated for the, for the, for the opportunity cost of, of, of enrolling the land into the program, maximizing even the benefit per dollar expanded is equivalent to maximizing Marshall aggregate surplus, that is sum of consumer surplus, producer surplus and even the benefits. Uh, so that's why we use efficient, uh, we, we measure efficiency by the totally even the benefits uh, per dollar expended. We measure equity by basically using a Gini coefficient which is constructed based, based on the CRP payments per capita of rural population. Of course you can, you can, you can, you can kind of uh, measure equity based on different criteria. So, the good news here is that, you know, regardless which criteria you use, the graph you get is very similar to this one. Okay. From here, we also measure the, the performance of these different targeting criteria relative to the efficiency equity frontier. 
So point A is kind of its benefits cost ratio target. Clearly achieve, it can achieve the highest efficiency, but it's performed relatively poorly in terms of distribution of equity. Okay. But surprisingly, uh, cost targeting performed really, really well in terms of economic efficiency. The reason, because the, the benefit, environmental the benefits of parcel offers are neg tend to be negatively correlated with the rental uh, payments. As a result, the cost ratio targeting and cost targeting will lead to the same lag enrolled into the program. Okay, so that's the reason why kind of a cost targeting is performed pretty well. And point C it represents the current targeting, but it's targeting based on the EBI, Environmental Benefit Index. And you can see they're not doing well relative to the efficiency equity frontier, which means that the program, the, the criteria could be redesigned to improve both economic, both economic efficiency and distributional equity. And if you look at the current targeting criteria, which means that USDA kind of gave up about 9% of efficiency for 18 to 23% of gain in distributional equity. And currently, there's a kind of a, a, there's a maximum, there's a cap on maximum rental rate allowed by USDA. If, if, you re, if you reduce that, kind of a, remove that kind of cap on rental rate, and you're going to be able, to, you'll be able to re improve uh, economic efficiency, but but you 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 will do that at a cost of distributional equity. And also, there's a cap, as as you know, on the maximum uh, acres allowed for Gating County. Right now, 25 percent, only more, no more than 25 percent of land can be in, in in CRP. If you remove that, if you reduce that cap a little, you'll be able to kind of. Uh, Reduce uh, you reduce efficiency, but without generating much improvement in in, in equity. So, uh, how much time? I have one minute, two minutes, three, zero minutes. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna so that main, main, that there are a lot of chat. None of the criteria we talk about is truly efficient because they are based on onset physical criteria without really taking into account some of the key feature of ecosystem such as you know, threshold effect, ecosystem linkage, and, and spatial interactions. And we have done quite a few studies to demonstrate that uh, the program efficiency can be improved dramatically <coughs> if you take this ecosystem feature into consideration. We have done quite a study mostly in the context of, of salmon restoration in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So I think because I'm running out of time, let me just, you know, in wrap it up by simply saying that in, in most conservation uh, investments, there are likely some uh, kind of a strong nonlinear relationship and ecosystem linkage that mitigate against politically palatable uh, funding criteria. A design of conservation program must recognize this uh, this uh, complication and formula or guideline based on onset physic physical criteria and uh, and. Uh, a likely result in uh, some, uh, some, some, some sub substantial benefit loss, okay? Although uh, uh, challenge or daunting payoff are potentially high when, when those ecological complexity are, are considered in the, in the design of conservation program. But thank you very much. <laughs>